Well, how many of you brought your Bible this morning? Will you hold up the Bible all over the building real fast? It's uh, 10.35, 25 minutes to 11 o'clock. I'd like to read some verses here this morning, and then I'll ask you, if you will, to uh, leave your Bibles open and just follow me along here this morning, all right? Uh, Isaiah chapter 22, page number 732, if you have an old Schofield Bible, all right? Don't forget our service this afternoon at, uh, at 5.30. I hope you'll be back. We need to be together in these days. We really need to get together, and so I want to encourage you. I hope I can do that some during the sermon this morning as well and just encourage our hearts just a little bit. So you bear with me. Look at the text with me. Let's read this. And then I want to go back and just lift one phrase out of this text and preach upon it real fast this morning. Look at verse 15, Isaiah 22, page 732 in the Old Schofield Bible, verse number 15. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sceptre here, as he that heweth him out a sceptre on high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock? Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. And I will drive thee from the station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that uh, I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I'll clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I'll commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So shall he open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups even to all the vessels of flagons. Now, leave your Bibles open. I know reading that, you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, my soul, what in the world does that have to do? But it has a lot to do with us. If you'll bear with me for just a moment, I want to share something with you from this text. Let's pray. Father, please bless your word. Help me this morning as I try to preach. And Lord, I need to leave some stuff out, so I pray that you'd help me to uh, leave some things out. And yet at the same time, God, help me to say everything that needs to be said here this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text this morning is about a man by the name of Shebna. Now, of course, Shebna is not one of those more familiar Bible characters. Again, I doubt anybody in here came to church this morning hoping to hear a message about old Shebna. His name means this, one who is carried in captivity. And according to our text, that's exactly what happened to this man by the name of Shebna. The Bible tells us in verse 15 that Shebna is the treasurer over the house of Judah. According to what I could read about the history of this man, uh, Shebna was like second in command, maybe we would say maybe the vice president, to a good king in Israel by the name of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a very godly leader who led the nation of Israel into a time of revival. Hezekiah was the one, if you remember, that God sent the message to him through the prophet Isaiah to set his house in order because he was going to die and not live. But then God miraculously gave old Hezekiah a 15 year extension to his life. Well, let me tell you something. Right by the side of godly King Hezekiah was this man. Maybe we could say he was his right-hand man by the name of Shebna. However, as so oftentimes happens, old Shebna got caught up in a scandal. Old Shebna used his position for his own personal profit. Now, you and I have just come through a season of elections here in America. We have been freshly acquainted with the fact of some scandals that break out in politicians' lives. Many times we have heard during these days of how this 
this politician or that politician is using his position for his own, uh, his own personal profit, his own personal possessions. And we know that politicians get caught up in a variety of scandals and corruptions. More than one good man has prostituted himself out for the possibility of great wealth. Well, can I tell you, that's the story of Shebna, a good man, a politician, the king's right-hand man, yet he used that position for his own personal gain. If you look down in verse number 15, God said, Hey, Shebna, what hast thou here? And then we read in verse number 16 that this old boy had evidently taken either the king's money or some of the nation's money, and he had purchased to himself a great sepulcher to be buried in. In fact, the Bible tells us there in verse 16 that it was a sepulcher on high. That means it was a very notable place. He wanted everybody to know how important he was. So he purchased this place for himself. And then if you look at verse 18, the Bible talks about in verse number 18 about him accumulating to himself chariots and horses. So evidently, here's a man that is a right-hand man of the king in the, in the, in the land of Judah, and he's used that position to purchase for himself various things in the land of Judah. And boy, I want to tell you something. God is highly upset with this politician who used his position in a wrong way for his own personal profit and his own personal power. Hey, can I stop and say God still gets highly offended and highly angered by politicians who step on others to try to get their own personal gain and profit. Anytime you see a politician that gets caught up in a scandal, and it's some kind of a true scandal, I want to tell you, God doesn't set up in heaven oblivious to it all. From what we read about Shebna, God was highly offended and highly angered by what Shebna had done. If you want to see how angry God was, look back at verse 18 when the Bible said that God shall surely and violently toss thee like a ball into a large country. You know what God said? I'm going to toss you like a ball into a bunch of high weeds. I mean, I'm so fed up with what you've done. I've had it up to here, Shebna, over what you've done. In fact, Shebna, I'm going to let you go off into captivity. You're not even going to get to use that sceptre that you built for yourself, and you're not going to get to glory in the chariots and the horses that you've accumulated for yourself. I'm going to toss you like a ball into a large field. God has his way, ladies and gentlemen, of dealing with crooked politicians. You hear me and hear me well. You may think, I may think people get by with stuff down here, but not on your life. Where we're headed, there's going to be a payday someday where you and I are headed to. Absolutely. Well, in our text this morning, God tells Shebna in verse number 20, I'm about to replace you, boy. I'm, I'm demoting you. You're no longer going to be the treasurer over the land of Judah. In fact, I'm going to put Eliakim in your place. Now, by the way, you got to like what's said about Eliakim in verse 21 and verse number 22. And what Eliakim does is he becomes one of those Old Testament pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll not take time to show you this, but if you'll look there at verse 21 and verse number 22, some of the thing, same things that said about Eliakim is said about the Lord Jesus over in the New Testament. God chose to write the story of his son in the Old Testament through the lives of other people and Eliakim is one of those who is a type, a picture of the Lord Jesus. But I want to fast forward through all that and I want you to come to the text this morning because I like what God says he's going to do to Eliakim. If you look down at verse number, well let me say, tell you this, you know if you go through the Bible God has called his people by a variety of different names. I mean God uses a lot of different names to describe what his people are supposed to be like. For instance over in the New Testament God's people are called witnesses. We're called ambassadors. We're called children. We're called sons. I mean you go through, we're called saints. We're called servants. All through the Bible God used a variety of different names to describe what his people are supposed to be like. But God does something unusual in this text in the fact that he calls Eliakim something uh, that previously he hasn't called anybody else as far as his people is concerned in the entire Bible. And if you'll look there at verse number 23, God said this to Eliakim, verse 23, I'm going to fasten you as a nail 
in a sure place. You know what God called Eliakim? God called Eliakim a nail. And he said, I'm going to fasten you in a sure place. Now let me stop and say, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm looking at, if you're the people of God this morning, and most of us in here are, can I tell you something? God calls us a bunch of nails. Amen. I know you never dreamed God probably called you a nail. But I'll tell you something in the Bible. God called Eliakim a nail. And God said, my people are going to be like nails. And then I like this, that are fastened in a sure place. Now that sure place to me is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad I got a place to get fastened to this morning. Hey, I'm glad I got a church that's a sure place. Not much sure in this world. I'm telling you, these are, these are tumultuous days in which you and I are living in. I'm telling you, we don't know what's about to happen, but I'm glad I got around me a sure place. I'm glad God drove me into the walls of a sure place. I'm glad I got a good place that I can come to and I can get a hold of God and I'm glad I got a place where God can get a hold of me. It's a sure place and I want to encourage you as we move into these days. Hey friend, fasten yourself to this sure place. We're about to get on a little bit of a bumpy ride. You know what I'm talking about. Hey, but I'm glad. Thank God there's a sure place. There's a refuge for the people of God. I'm a nail fastened in a sure place. I got to thinking about that nail, that nail. I brought one with me this morning. I got to thinking about that nail and how that nail, you know Webster's defines a nail as this. It's a slender pointed and headed fastener designed to be pounded in. Another definition says this, a nail is a small, thin piece of metal with one end pointed and one flat end that you hit into something in order to fasten it or to join it to something else. Now, you know what a nail is. I mean, I don't mean to, I don't want to talk down to you. I, I get it. You know what a nail is. But have you ever thought about how God's people are like a bunch of nails? So this morning, what I want to do quickly is I want to give you three things about the nail as it relates to God's people. First of all, let me say, number one, that nails are made for hammering. Nails are made for hammering. You know something? You can find nails in the most expensive mansions this world has to offer. But thank God you can also find a bunch of nails in a barn out in the middle of nowhere. You know, no matter where you put a nail, that old nail is just hanging there doing their job. You know, nails are not made out of silver or gold. They're made out of iron. I don't know what this was made out of, but they used to make them out of iron. I remember vividly one time going out and I watched my grandma out in the front yard. She had this big old nail that she had found and she took that nail and she drove it right down beside one of the bushes in her yard. And I, asked, I said, Mama, what in the world are you doing? She said, that nail's made out of iron and through the years that old nail will begin to dissolve back into the earth from which it would came and it will release some iron into that plant and help that plant to be a healthy nail. I asked in our early service, how many have ever seen anybody do something? I was amazed at the number of people that slipped their hand up saying, yes, I've saw people do that before. I guess my mama wasn't as crazy as maybe I thought that she was. But nobody ever buys a nail just so they'll have some nails. Nobody ever buys a nail so they can just sit around in a box or a bag somewhere. Nobody buys a nail just so they can sit around and beautify a shelf or a cabinet. I can honestly tell you, I'm 57 years old, I can honestly tell you that nobody's ever come to my house and complimented me on the set of nails that I have. I can't remember anybody ever coming to my house saying, hey, Brother Tim, I didn't come to see you. I didn't come to see Miss Sandy. I didn't come to see a house. I come to see your nails. You know some folks, nails don't get a lot of recognition in this world. They're not made for beauty. In fact, nails are even rarely ever seen. The reason people buy nails is to hammer them into something. To put it bluntly, nails are made for hammering. They're not made for boxes. They're not made for decorations. They're made for hammering. That's right. God saved every last one of us in this room who are saved. God turned us into a nail and he made us that way so he could hammer on us a little bit. 
Now you say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, when you read through the Bible, you'll find out in the Bible the Word of God is likened to a variety of things. For instance, it's likened to honey, it's likened to milk, it's likened to a lamp, it's likened to a fire, it's likened to a mirror, it's likened to seed, it's likened to a sword. But did you know in the Bible the Word of God is likened unto a hammer? That's right. Look at this verse right here. Jeremiah 23, 29, Is not my word like a fire? There's the fire part. Saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rocks in pieces. You know why God saved you? You know why God saved me? God saved us because he wants to hammer on us. He made us a nail so he, he could just take the hammer of his word and hammer on us. Just a little bit. Boy, aren't you glad for the day that God turns you into a nail and by the hammer of his word, he's been driving you into a sure place. And I'll tell you, my prayer is, I don't know how you feel about what's happened. Let me give you some of the words that I feel in my soul this morning. Number one, I feel anger. Number two, I feel grief. Number three, I feel disappointment. Number four, I feel nauseated. Number five, I feel mad. Number six, I feel like I want to hurt somebody. Number seven, I feel like I want to shoot somebody. Number eight, I just feel like killing somebody. I'm telling you, my soul is in a mess this morning, but I'm glad I got a God in heaven and turn me into a nail, put me in a sure place. And my prayer in these days, oh God, drive me deep. Oh God, don't let me, just don't put me in just a little bit. God, help me. God, work on me. God, hammer me. God, speak to me. God, work in my life. Drive me in to the sure place. Boy, if there's ever been a day, if there's ever been an hour that you ought to pray, oh God, drive me in the sure place. Oh God, drive me deep. God, just don't tap on me a little bit, but oh God, work on me. Nails are made for hammering. Boy, I want God to hammer on my life. You know why? I realize I'm about that far away from the greatest failure I've ever had, messing up everything that I've stood for and tried to live for, messing you up, messing this church up, messing my family up. Hey, I don't want God just to tap on me. I want him to drive me deep, drive me deep. That ought to be our prayer in these days. Oh, God, I don't know where we're going, but oh, God, drive me deep, drive me deep, drive me deep. I want to be a nail in our sure place. Nails are made for hammering. Amen. Number two, I'm trying to hurry. Nails are made for holding. They're made for holding. Nails, nails are made to hold things together. That's what I'm trying to say. If I had two pieces of wood, drive that bad boy back through there. If I had two pieces of wood and I wanted to hold those two pieces of wood together, I ain't going to duct tape them. Now, I believe duct tape will fix anything, but I'm not going to duct tape. You know why? It ain't going to last long. I'm not going to get me some Elmer's glue and, 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 and glue those boards together. If I want them boards to stay together, if I want them boards to adhere to each other, the best thing I know to do is to get me a big old nail and drive, hammer that nail into that other piece to hold things together. Can I say this? Nails are uniters. Nails bring things together. Hey, can I stop and tell you that even in the Bible, the Lord Jesus is referred to as a nail? That's right. Did you ever know your Savior was a nail? The Bible said that Jesus is God's nail. Look at this verse right here. Ezra chapter 9 verse 8, about right there in the middle. It says this, to give us a nail in his holy place. Now watch this. I'm a nail in a sure place, but Jesus is God's nail in a holy place. That holy place was that holiest of all. And when that sacrifice was made on that brazen altar and brought through the holy place into the holiest of all and God accepted the blood of that innocent substitute, God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a nail in a holy place. There's something, friend, we can hang on to. I don't know where our nation's headed. I don't know what's coming down the road. But aren't you glad in the person of the Son of God we've got a nail 
nail in a, bless God, in a holy place. Thank God I can hang on to in these last days because he's a nail and he brought things together. Nails are for holding, friend. I think about when Jesus was hanging on the cross. You know what, God, what Jesus was? He was God's nail on that cross. I mean, on that cross, he united things. He united, he united people together. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, Jesus reached up and grabbed the holy hand of a righteous God, reached down into the muck and mire of our sin and grabbed the sinful man of humanity. And there on the cross of Calvary, as he made the sacrifice of all sacrifices, the nail, God's nail in a holy place brought together the holy righteousness of God and the wicked sinfulness of man. And through the nail that was being offered on Calvary, both were satisfied and he brought us back together. He united us together. And I'm glad this morning, thank God, he's holding us together. Dead men, nails are for, uh, for holding. I want to be a nail. I want to I wanna be a, I wanna hold things together. Listen, now is not the time for you to quit. Amen. Now is not the time for you to retreat and for me to retreat. Now is not the time for me to say, let's go in the closet and just forget about things. I mean, our way didn't work out. We look like we're on the losing end. It looks like it's over. It'll never be the same. I've heard all of that. But I'm telling you now, it's the time for God's people, bless God, to, to say, oh God, drive me deep. And God, help me. I've got to keep my family together. I've got to keep my church together. I've got to hold others together. Nails are for holding. They strengthen things. Those nails, all over this building, there are nails driven in this water. Oh, they're carrying the load, friend. They're holding things together. They're holding up things, and they're keeping it all together. I want to be a nail for Jesus. We even got a little saying that we use about nails. You ever heard this one before? Be tough as nails. Now's the time for God's people to be tough as nails. Now's the time for God's people to grab a hold and hang on Amen. and be tough as nails. Hey, you got more about you than lace on your drawers. Hey, now's not the time to back up. Shut up. Now's the time to stand up. Now's the time to speak up. We're getting ready to get caught up. And until then, God help us to be tough as nails. Amen. Amen. Be tough. If you're tough, you'll show back up tonight. Amen. Amen. Nails are for hammering. Nails are for holding. Number three, nails are for hanging. Nails are for hanging. You say, preacher, what do you mean about that? Well, you say you got a picture at your house and you want to beautify your home by putting that picture up there. Now, I'm not talking about this stuff, what I call that stuff earlier, what I call that stuff. Command strips. I'm not talking about that. Sissies use command strips. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm talking about nails. Maybe you got this pretty picture that you want to hang up in your house in a very prominent place to beautify your house. So what do you do? You got to hang that picture on something. So you go grab your nail. And you drive that nail. Boy, you put it in. You don't want to put it in just a piece of sheetrock. You want to drive it deep. So you find you a two before. It's supposed to be 16 inches apart. And you find you one. And you put that nail and you drive that nail in. And then you put that picture up and you hang it on the wall. And there you step back and say, man, isn't that pretty? Now, wait a minute. I've never had anybody come to my house and say, boy, do you mind moving that picture? I want to see how pretty that nail is. We don't say that, do we? Because watch me, it ain't about the nail. It's about the picture. Amen. I mean that old nail. Stand, and by the way, have you ever thought about this? We beat them on the head, but they keep on hanging. <laughs> hey, this old world, can I tell you something? Don't be mad. We got beat on the head this week. But I ain't... I ain't about to wiggle out, friend. 
boy, I put this one in. Good. I don't want out. I didn't come to get out. I want to keep on hanging. You put that picture up there, nobody ever pays a compliment to the nail. They say, what a beautiful picture. But day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, there stands that nail holding it all up. That nail realizes it ain't about me. It's about the picture. When God wanted to show his love, God put the picture of his son on the cross of Calvary. And then God nailed it there as a picture of how much he loves you and how much he loves me. Those nail, God hung him there. God hung him there as a picture for his love for you and for me. Amen. You ever heard this saying before? Boy, we need a place, a nail to hang our hat. My understanding, in the old days, people would just drive a nail in the wall. When they'd come in, take their coat off, they'd just hang the coat on the nail. Men would take their hat off and hang their, 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 their hat on the nail because nails, they're for hanging. I got to thinking, boy, there's a lot hanging on me today. I'm just a nail in a sure place. God drive me deep because there sure is a lot hanging on me. Can I show you something? This is crazy, but I want to show it to you. This is my billfold. <clears throat> Don't come up to me after church want money because there ain't none in it. I am a Baptist preacher and silver and gold have I none. But I tell you what's in here. It's a picture of every member of my family. My wife's picture's in here. My children's picture's in here. My in-laws' picture's in here. My little grandbaby's pictures are in here. And can I show you something? They all hanging on me. They're looking to me. They're looking at Papa. They're saying, preach, Papa, preach. Papa, don't give up. Hey, Papa, don't let down. Papa, you got to keep hanging because, Papa, we all hanging on you. Now, I hope if something ever happens to me and I, and I fall out, I hope my kids have got enough about them, they'll keep on serving God. But I tell you what, boy, there sure is a lot. Of, hey, sir, why don't you look down that row where you're sitting at this morning at them little children. Look at that wife. Hey, can I tell you something, Dad? They're hanging on you. They're hanging on you this morning. And what about this? What if you... What if you start working your way loose just a little bit? What if you get a little bit wobbly? Hey, what if you let up and eventually you fall out? A little delayed action. You fall out. If I fall out, my whole family falls with me. If I fall out, what's going to happen to this church? I know you say, well, get us another preacher. I get it. I want you to. But I'm going to hurt a lot of people in here if I fall out. If I turn loose, if I wiggle my way out. You all see what I did with that? Thank you, Brother Zach. I'm going to hurt a whole lot of people if I turn loose. So, Lord... Drive me deep. Now's not the time for us to be playing church. Now's not the time for you to be tapped on. Oh, God, take the hammer of your word. Drive me deep. Now I'm done. We got to go. But I want you to look at this. Sometimes nails get bent. Sometimes God's hammering on us and we resist it and we bend. And can I tell you something? A bent nail is not worth anything. You can't use a bent nail. But God in his grace gets the hammer back out again. God begins to...
And God takes an old crooked nail, makes him straight again, puts him back in that sure place. Starts hammering on him again. Drive me deep, Lord. I want to be a nail in a sure place. I challenge you. Don't you get mad. I, just let me get mad. You don't get mad. Look, man. Jesus said it's going to be like this. Did we think we're going to get through these last days and everything's just going to be... Are you kidding me? He said it's going to be like this. Drive me deep, Lord. Drive me deep. I want to be a nail in a sure place. Let's pray. God, help us in these.